Okay. So, okay, it's been uh, so far cool, fun, nice. Now for the dark part of it. People really hate my talks because I talk about bad things. The thing is, it's a bad world and we need to fix it. So, uh, <laughs> Let's talk about relief enterprise and what is it? Uh, you know, what happens, you know, I know that Viv uh, actually met Viv when she actually came to me and said, you know, those things you're saying, that's not right. You know, I do relief and I do it in a good way. And I do make an impact. I said, how so? So she started, you know, yada, yada, yada. So I said, you know, you come to TEDx TRP and you present your model. Then I'll talk last and I'll present what the problems are. So the problem is, you know, when disaster strikes, some people are given a burden. It's a burden to endure disaster and live with the conditions left by disaster. Now, some of the people are given a gift. Those of us who are spared by disaster are given the gift of being spared by disaster. And I always ask people this question. How can we not use our gift to lift the burden of others? You know, disaster could strike for us tomorrow. When you see disasters happening somewhere else, you're getting a gift. The gift that it didn't happen here, that it didn't happen to you. And some people, they didn't ask for it. They're not being punished by God or gods or goddesses or whatever. They're suffering. They didn't ask for it. They don't deserve it. What happens when disaster strikes? The people who die when disaster strikes, it's an accident of nature. What happened after disaster strikes is our responsibility. Any person who dies after disaster strikes, it's our fault because we fail to respond quickly or in an efficient manner. The people who die when disaster strikes, it's nature's fault. It's an accident of nature. The people who die and suffer after disaster strikes are our fault. It's our responsibility. We know that we respond to disaster. $12 billion was sent to Haiti. We have kids from Singapore going over to Indonesia to build houses. So why do people who suffer disaster still in such a bad shape? Why are the societies not coming back? Why, if we are responding, $12 billion is a lot of money. So why are we failing so badly? Well. Although some of the speakers have talked about helping and now being, you know, it's about solidarity, I actually, I don't think that helping is any help. I don't think you can help anyone. I don't think it's any use to help, at least not in the way we're doing it. Often when we help, and this is what I've seen in the field, this is 12 years of suffering and getting your heart broken by seeing things not working. Often when we help, we make life decisions for those we are helping. You see people being moved around from one place to another. You see um, survivors camp, they call them refugee camps. They, uh, they, they end up, they go from being survivors, very brave people who endure a hurricane, who endure earthquake, who endure a tsunami, who actually worked for days, went for weeks without food and water. They were survivors, they were brave people. We turn them into refugees, like cattle, we start to move them around. And we start to make life decisions for them. It's not good for you to live there. It's not good for you to be there. We'll put you here with these people from over there. We make life decisions for others. Often, when we help, we fail to see the whole picture and we feel so happy to help. I remember one time I was loading uh, three trucks on the, back, uh, on the backyard of, uh, of a friend. His wife, she got us a huge amount of donations. But my friend, he's a business guy. So he comes to me and he says, you know, we have like 10 guys loading up three trucks with mattresses and food and everything. And he comes to me and he asks me, this is in Santo Domingo, 10 hours from Port-au-Prince. So he, he comes to me and he says, are there no trucks in Haiti? And I go like, mm, I guess. And he says, are there no truck drivers after the earthquake? And I go like, mm, I guess. And I know he has a point somewhere. And he says, why? And I say, why? He said, 
then why the hell are you not hiring truck drivers and trucks from Haiti to come here, load the trucks, and then drive back there? Because you're getting truck drivers from, your con from our country to go there and come back empty. It's the same thing, but if you hire people from there, you're actually helping them because you're employing them. I never thought about that. He's a business guy. He saw it clearly. You know, I'm paying like $2,000 per truck. That money could go to Haitian people, the people I'm trying to help. But I never thought about it. It was easier for me to just go through the yellow pages, find a truck company in my city, and hire it, even if it's more expensive, even if the money stays in my country. So we fail to see the whole picture. We are actually, uh, we measure our success by the actions we do, not by, not by the impact of our actions. So if I send 12 trucks to Haiti, hey, I'm a superstar. I tweet about it. I put it on Facebook. I have a picture in front of the trucks. No. <laughs> But no one cares where that trucks actually went to or where the goods went, went to. You know, because we measure success by the actions we take, not by the impact they achieve. So we search the approach most efficient to us, not to those we're trying to help. Often when we help, we destroy the very same environment we're trying to help. I once worked for years with a mountain village, bringing technology, telecommunications, voice over IP, um, electricity to this community. And I was like so happy that we were doing all this thing. I was profiled with, uh, on, by United Nations and, and by CNN and all over the world. So it was like really cool work. You know, you could put it in your resume and on your website. And then, and then the kids, like, they, they, they went from being like seven and eight and nine. They went to 11, 12, so they started to use Messenger and they, they friended you on Facebook and uh, so I was like happy to see what we're doing. Then they hit 18, 16, and they started to send me emails. Carlos, can you please help me get a scholarship? I want to go to college. I want to be an engineer. And then it hit me. These kids, we had shown them the, more, the world. They were going to leave their community, and they were never going to go back there because there's no work for them back there. We were busy showing them the world, bringing internet to them, but we were destroying the community. All those kids were going to leave the community and never come back. In Haiti, there was one hospital that survived, private hospital that survived the earthquake in Port-au-Prince. Six weeks after the earthquake, it had to shut down. It faced the possibility of having to shut down. Why? Why would a hospital that survived have to shut down in a city that needs hospitals, that needs doctors? Israel, Argentina, the U.S., Italy. The U.S. had a, a, they had a ship on the, uh, on the sea. But Israel, Argentina, and Italy, they all set up field hospitals. Israel had over 120 military personnel, very cool hospital. I have videos of it. They had a tent. They had triage. They had a tent that was OBGYN. They had a tent that had, uh, they could do MRI. They could do everything. They flew all those things from Israel there. So it's a lot of money spent. None of them bothered to ask around if there was a hospital. They came, they set up their field hospital, they did a great job. So did the Argentinians, so did the Italians. But that the one hospital that was employing doctors, employing nurses, and providing local services that had electricity, that had, uh, that had beds, that had everything that a hospital is supposed to have, it had to shut down because no one is going there. And they, they had no money to pay for the nurses. They had no money to pay for fuel, for electricity. They had no money for anything. But Argentina, Israel, Italy, they did a great job setting up their field hospitals. But we failed to see the whole picture. We failed to see the environment we want to help. Often when we help, we displace local capacity. The hospitals have to shut down. We bring volunteers to the, we. You know, this is Singapore. Many, of, many Singaporean kids actually fly to Indonesia to build houses. Why? Can't Indonesians build houses by themselves? You know, how much is a flight from here to Indonesia? The same thing happened in Haiti. I saw that there's, there's a roof for Haiti, bringing 100, 200 volunteers to build houses in Haiti. Yeah, volunteers, you don't pay for them, but they actually spend money. It's money spent. If you look at the numbers, this is, this is money that's been spent on people who are not from the disaster area, 
go in there to build houses. Why not take that money and pay locals to do it? Give them dignity. Give them something to do. So, like I said, you know, we often measure our success by the delivery of, of help or the completion of actions and not the actual impact. So then what can we do? You know, you talk a big talk about not helping. You're telling people not to help others? Yeah. Never help. Enable, engage, empower, and connect. If you want to create change, if you want to jumpstart change, if you want to have an impact, never help. Enable, engage, empower, and connect. That's what needed. What's the problem with disaster we live today? This is, the, this is what the problem is. You have international donors providing money and resources that mostly go to foreign ecosystems and largely remain outside the local ecosystem. This money and resources are meant for relief services which are meant to be delivered to intervention areas. Now, they largely end up in the foreign ecosystem because they're largely spent on foreign resources. We get volunteers, providers, professionals. We bring doctors, we bring uh, nurses. I used to work with the Vermont Relief Group, great group of nurses. Every two weeks, they were, they were rotating 12 nurses from Vermont going to Port-au-Prince. Now, who knows who Vermont is? A ticket from Vermont to Haiti is like $1,500. And these nurses are paying for their own tickets. So this is not a, a wasteful uh, bureaucratic organization. This is people with solidarity. They were paying for, they were taking their vacation days to go there and help. But if you look at the whole picture, you have, you're, you're flying 12 nurses from Vermont to Haiti, $1,500, multiply, multiply that by 12, and then food and shelter for them. To do what? If there's any nurse, she's gonna be mad at me, but what does a nurse do? Tend to a patient. Are there no nurses in Haiti? I'm sure the nurses from Vermont, they have like better procedures, better experience or whatever. But you know, get me one of those nurses from Grace Anatomy. When, you know, they had nurses that buzzes everyone around. She will get the Haitian nurses in shape right away. <laughs> and we can save $30,000 that could be spent in the local people. So, you know, they're trying to help. They're paying for their own tickets. They're paying for their own expenses. But still, it's not efficient. So the problem we have is that the money is spent in goods and services, providers, volunteers, professionals, in foreign resources. And just a very, very little fraction of the money actually reaches the intervention areas. And we could be spending that money in the intervention areas. We could be using the people in the, in the survivor camps. Now, who are the people who survived disaster? Who are the people who survived disaster? Are they any different from us? Are they like monsters punished by God? Are they like useless people? Are they like lacking skills and that's why disaster hit them? You know, what appears to be random or chaos when you look at a survivor's camp, it is not. There's order, there's social structure in it. If you've seen how one of these camps is built, you've seen how, all, how they are all built. Anyone who's, who comes from a poor country or has been to a slum area knows how it happens because it's the same organic process. People come from different places. Sometimes they, they are displaced from one common area. Sometimes they get together along the way. But you get a critical mass of people who need a place to stay. They look for a place they can clean or a place they can occupy because it's the right. It's their God-given right to have a place on this earth. So they look for a place. They don't care about what that place is. They just look for a place they can occupy. When they find it, the young and strong clear the land. Now, that land is divided into small lots. And each lot is assigned to one family unit. There's no book for this. There's no handbook for this. But this is how it happens. Before they occupy this land, and if you look closely, you will see that there are divisions here and here. And you see how these are all small tents. And there are even, I'll show you some more pictures. So this always happens. So there's, there's some social structure here. These people, they know each other. Either because they come from the same place, or because they got together around, along the way, or because they're sharing the same conditions. Oh, I went backwards. 
There's people there, professionals, children, mothers, hairdressers, hairstylists, you know, all kinds of professions. There's structure there. They are in the middle of disaster, but they took time to leave some space to play soccer. This is not random. This is social. This is organic. This is real. This is a survival camp. And they left a huge plaza area. There's no architects among them. But they know that they need a social space. So they leave some space for playing soccer or getting together or doing whatever a society does. When disaster strikes, the physical infrastructure is destroyed. This is actually an orphanage. 26 kids live in there. That's a cardboard orphanage. There's no physical infrastructure but the social structure remains. People's capacity is untouched. Their needs are the same. So you still have orphanages. There, there are no buildings to host them, but you still have one guy taking care of 26 children. You still have one woman who's a hairdresser. You still have a tailor. You still have a teacher. Disaster doesn't destroy the knowledge or capacity. Teachers are still teachers, doctors are still doctors, nurses are still nurses, carpenters are still are carpenters. And where are they? They are in those camps. Those are the people living there. Professionals. They had a life before disaster strike. They had a life. They had knowledge and capacity. And they still do. Why do we insist in ignoring them? So this is what we are trying to do. I showed you the model before of what the problem is. Our model is to actually solve this problem by building three different uh, approaches. One is to build a database of local goods and services providers that connects people, local goods, with global, with global markets. Then to do a capacity building and certification program so you can actually hire these people, employ these people, and be confident on their skills and to build a global marketplace of local goods and services. So that's, what entrep uh, that's why entrepreneurial response is. That's, what, that's why Relief Enterprise is. We've been working on that for 11 months. The idea is to actually build on the capacity of people who survive disaster and to certify them to improve their capacity and connect them with the organizations doing relief work and to connect them with us as a global market of consumers. I hope this. Uh, gives you an idea of what's happening and what can be done. If anyone of you is interested, uh, just approach us.